Good morning. Um, and uh, good afternoon to our friends in, uh, in the East. Um, I am uh, Dr. Luke Evnen. I'm chairman of the board of directors at the Scleroderma Research Foundation. And uh, as many of you know, the SRF is based in San Francisco, where we're, uh, we're live uh, this morning. Um, a, a few words about the SRF before we uh, go into uh, the webinar uh, for, uh, for the next hour. Um, so the, the SRF has been in business, uh, as many of you know, since 1987, uh, to identify promising research and support it until there is a cure for scleroderma. Uh, we are proud to be America's leading nonprofit investor in scleroderma research. And over its life, the SRF has invested more than $30 million in scleroderma research, and it currently funds in excess of a million dollars annually in pursuit of its long-term mission. And with that, that leads me to um, express a really heartfelt thank you to, to many of you who are actually on the phone today and many others. The foundation is exclusively supported by generous donors in the scleroderma community. And of course, your support is what makes everything that we do possible. And although we are best known for our research support, we are not solely focused on a long-term goal of a cure. We want to improve patients' lives today. And with the knowledge that is resident in expert clinical and research community doctors today. We are committed to informing patients about the changes taking place on the treatment front and empowering each patient to optimize their choices. Inside our website, there are numerous resources for the patient, and I would strongly encourage those who have not had a chance to browse our library to take some time to do so. Our newest feature to assist patients is this webinar series, which will feature expert speakers on topics that are crucial to you. Webinars will be broadcast live and we will record them for later viewing on the SRF website. All the webinars are scheduled to last an hour, and within that time, we will include a short Q&A session, which will follow the formal, the formal presentation. Our topic today is progress and promise in scleroderma clinical research, and we are absolutely delighted to have really the foremost expert in the field, Dr. Jim Seibold. However, before turning over the microphone, I wanted to provide a bit of context for Dr. Seibold's remarks. We are really in a period of actually just explosive growth in the scleroderma research community. There are more than 30 clinical trials taking place today, and the vast majority of these are actually commercially sponsored. <clears throat> I mean, on the one hand, we have sponsors that continue to work to improve the vasodilator therapy that has become a mainstay of PAH treatment. And sponsors such as Actillion, Genentech, Metamune, Gilead, and Novartis, though, are moved beyond vasodilators and are working on agents that hold promise as antifibrotic agents and as immune system modulators as well. Of course, in addition to these efforts, the NIH continues to support large trials which use currently available agents in search of improving the current standard of care. Let me switch back and talk a little bit about our speaker today. Dr. James Seibold is principal member of Scleroderma Research Consultants, founded to foster advances in care, education, and research for persons with scleroderma and related disorders. He is also editor of Scleroderma Care and Research and on the editorial boards of Clinical and Experimental Rheumatology and the International Journal of Rheumatology. Dr. Seibold was most recently Chief of the Division of Rheumatology at the University of Connecticut Health Center in Farmington. Previously, he was the Marvin and Betty Danto Research Professor of Connective Tissue Research and Professor of Internal Medicine in the Division of Rheumatology and was the founding director of the University of Michigan Scleroderma Program. Prior to his professorship at Michigan, he served as Chief of the Division of Rheumatology, Director of the Clinical Research Center, and Chair of the Department of Clinical Pharmacology at the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Jersey. Dr. Seibold has authored over 300 scientific publications on scleroderma and the various organ manifestations, and also very relevant for today's discussion, Dr. Seibold has led or been a key participant in nearly every major interventional trial of scleroderma since 1980. 
We welcome him today to discuss progress and promise in scleroderma clinical trials. As a primer on the format for today for our audience, questions can be asked by using the chat functionality in the conference window. Please do keep in mind, though, that our conferences are for general information purposes only, and unfortunately, no information provided can be considered to be specific medical device. And accordingly, we will not be able to answer any questions pertaining to a specific patient's symptoms. With that, let me turn it over to Jim. Please go ahead. Marvelous. Uh, thank you, Luke. It's really a pleasure to be involved in the first webinar. I've been a strong supporter of the mission of the Scleroderma Research Foundation over the years, and I think what uh, the SRF has done in research leadership has been uh, really quite remarkable, and I'm really pleased to participate in this additional element of reaching out to the community of uh, patients and uh, relatives of individuals with scleroderma. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, I'd like to echo the sense of excitement that I have personally about how much progress and activity is going on in the world of scleroderma clinical research. I've been in this field for more than 30 years, and I have never seen a period of time uh, that would engender more general optimism that we're on the cusp of developing truly effective therapies. I thought that I would concentrate today's talk on how we think about clinical research and drug development in scleroderma to try to foster a more general understanding by the patient community about the problems that uh, the research community and our sponsors and partners face in trying to make progress here. So I guess the, the first point that needs to be made is that scleroderma is a very heterogeneous disease. In my personal experience, I've had the privilege of caring for more than 8,000 individuals with scleroderma, and I can honestly say that I've never met two patients that had the same set of circumstances, either in terms of how their disease progressed or what complications happened or what the timing of the complications was. Uh, Maybe to instruct you here is that we think of scleroderma mainly as a prototypical disease of fibrosis. Uh, hold on a second. My eyes. But I think most people realize that scleroderma sort of segregates into two uh, different entities. The first entity is called diffuse scleroderma, and that's an entity where there's fairly rapid progression in the extent and severity of skin thickening in the early years of disease. And what we're beginning to recognize increasingly is that many people with diffuse scleroderma hit spontaneously a plateau where the skin thickening seems to slow down and that in later years of disease, the skin actually spontaneously improves. When the skin is worsening in the early years of disease, that's when the risk of picking up problems with the internal organs is the highest. So there's a clear opportunity to try to do very preventative things early on in diffuse scleroderma. Then you contrast that with limited scleroderma, what used to be called Crest syndrome. Here we're looking at a relatively flat uh, graph of how the skin changes from year to year over the course of the disease. So if I had a wonder drug that actually completely prevented skin thickening, it would be very easy to measure it in people with diffuse scleroderma with very active skin thickening, but very difficult to measure over short periods of time whether or not the drug was beneficial in individuals with limited scleroderma. And just to come back to that critical point is that although we measure the skin, the disease by skin, what we're really worried about is internal organ involvement because that's ultimately what influences survival, functionality, quality of life. So, Risk of heart, lung, and kidney disease is high in early diffuse scleroderma. It's much lower in later diseases. Risk of internal organ involvement is very low in the early years of limited scleroderma, but then starts to get higher as the disease becomes more mature with important complications like pulmonary hypertension to be considered. 
We could spend the whole hour on this slide, and I'm not going to. This, I think, is one of the critically important roles of the Scleroderma Research Foundation over the years. Is it trying to understand the pathogenesis, the actual mechanism of disease, is really like trying to assemble a jigsaw puzzle. And small elements of individual hardworking laboratory investigations are beginning to actually sort of develop a cohesive understanding about how scleroderma develops. We understand that it tends to start uh, with blood vessel damage, uh, and we're now increasingly recognize the way that some of the immune elements that are in the blood interfere with the da damage to the blood vessel and then activate other cells that are near blood vessels, and that as we progress on we lead to sort of a final common pathway where there's an overdevelopment of a population of cells called myofibroblasts that are responsible for increased production of collagen and other proteins that leads to the skin thickening and the scarring. So blood vessel injury followed by myofibroblast activation, and the question is how do you link those? And it, we're increasingly sophisticated in terms of our understanding about which cells of the immune system participate, which chemical signals are elaborated that actually run the process. So if you were sitting back looking at how to try to interrupt scleroderma, what you should see is not hopeless complexity, but what you should see are multiple opportunities to intervene in this whole cascade of events. So which one of these pathways, if we could block it effectively with a specific drug, would actually lead to something of true clinical benefit to the patient population? So as we work in the laboratory, uh, we also need to see whether or not there are ways of testing the utility of a drug uh, before we take it to the stage of human testing. And there's been tremendous advance recently in developing mouse models of scleroderma that look to be totally instructive. Uh, the FRA2 transgenic mouse is an inbred genetic strain that is our first ever example of a mouse variant of scleroderma that develops extensive scarring of the lung that mimics what we see in people with scleroderma. I've been a little trouble with my red dot. There we go. So here's a slide of the lung that's showing very exuberant scar, and this is what healthy lung would look like. But at the same time, this same mouse model develops uh, damage to the small blood vessels, uh, which is a hallmark of scleroderma. So here we're looking at a human uh, pulmonary artery in a patient that probably had pulmonary arterial hypertension and a very similar uh, series of changes in the mouse model. So to give you an example of how this works, uh, here we have a slide that shows uh, the mouse untreated, uh, showing some blood vessel damage. And then we see what happens when you uh, block that whole process with a category of drug called a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, where the blood vessel damage is completely arrested. And while this is going on, here we see the untreated lung. All that blue staining is scar. And here we see what happens to the lung after it's treated with this class of medications. So one might look at this and say, well, this is great. If you can actually stop blood vessel injury and stop lung scarring in a mouse model, then that would be a plausible uh, concept to treat, to approach in human disease. And in fact, such trials are both in progress with additional ones planned. I like to think of this sometimes though, and I hope this leads to improved understanding, that this is a little bit like the big bad wolf in the three little pigs. When the body produces collagen, uh, it can get very tightly cross-linked and can be a very long-lasting substance in the skin. So advanced scar in the skin is a little bit like the brick house that the wolf couldn't blow down. Whereas in early uh, fibrosis, and particularly in the kind of fibrosis that we see in the mouse models, that collagen can turn over in as short a period of time as two or three weeks. So sometimes what we see in the mouse models is that we see a big effect because the collagen is so much like the straw house but then when we turn to the human disease, we're really trying to treat the brick house. And uh, it becomes a, a little bit more 
a, a little bit different, a strategic issue. So Luke and I share a strong interest in persuading people that scleroderma is a very important disease and it deserves uh, their attention. Uh, and when we're talking to potential sponsors of research, we point out that scleroderma uh, represents a critically important unmet medical need. We are in a wonderful position where we can now talk about how sophisticated and advanced our scientific understanding is so that we can begin to design trials that actually meet something, meet some standard that would be deserving of attention based on our laboratory research. But we also talk about scleroderma in terms of this critical element of it being a platform disease. And what I mean by that is that scleroderma is a critically important disease, but in general, there are many diseases that have very high impact on the patients that have them, where scarring or fibrosis is a critical element. So there are individuals that get just lung scarring, uh, just liver scarring, for example, cirrhosis. There are a lot of individuals that get problems with heart scarring. So that if you could develop an effective anti-fibrosis therapy that was uh, a good treatment for scleroderma, that would have broad applicability to a broad family of similar or related conditions. So the question becomes, if you had an effective therapy for scleroderma, what would you want it to look like? I mean, what is your standard for judging that a drug would be effective? So we do have a consensus definition of what an effective therapy would be, one that actually modified the course of disease, and that would be an intervention that improves survival. One would expect that to happen if you could prevent the occurrence of some internal organ complication, for example, prevent heart, lung, or, di or kidney disease, or to come up with a therapy that actually changed the natural history of an established internal organ complication. I would submit that we actually already have drugs that would be classified as DMARDs, or disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors are a uniquely effective way of taking care of the high blood pressure of scleroderma renal involvement. And they've taken that complication that used to be universally fatal in the late 1970s and made it where it's uh, almost uh, impossibly easy to treat if you recognize it at the earliest stage. We have some preliminary data with drugs for pulmonary arterial hypertension, including epiprostanol and other prostacyclins and the endothelium receptor antagonist that offer strong suggestions that they actually improve survival in individuals with pulmonary arterial hypertension. We have some exciting data with aggressive treatments for certain types of lung disease with cyclophosphamide that argue that we can improve survival in lung as well. And then there's exciting work going on with immunoablation with reconstitution, typically referred to in the public as stem cell transplant, that argues that there's a potential survival benefit as well. So we're really on the cusp of having already met that definition of a truly effective therapy. The question, though, is, is are there other ways to measure success in scleroderma, or are there other strategies that we might use to be able to test whether or not an agent was effective or not? And I'm going to take you through a couple of examples because I think you'll begin to understand what some of the uh, strategic intellectual issues are around trial design. So the first one we'll talk about will be the modified Rodden skin score which is usually done in association with the health assessment questionnaire, a measure of just how well you can do things, and the SF36, which is a standardized measure of quality of life. And then we'll touch on organ-specific approaches, a new composite response index. We've already talked about survival and event-free survival, and one can see that we've made a lot of progress in that regard. So we've proposed a another definition of disease-modifying uh, therapies for scleroderma, where the primary endpoint in a study would be to reduce the modified Rodman skin score and have that be associated with improved patient function and quality of life. So what is the modified Rodman skin score? It's become the standard way of assessing 
uh, individual scleroderma. 17 body areas are assessed by simple clinical palpation, just the doctor feeling your skin, and are scored in each area as being zero for normal skin or one, two, or three for mild, moderate, or severe skin thickening. This whole technique has become highly validated and there have been organized efforts in recent years to train hundreds of physicians, both in the European Union and in the United States, to use this as an office tool. So why would one want to do a skin score? Well, it's the primary way that we classify disease as diffuse versus limited. If the skin thickening gets above the elbows or above the knees, that equals diffuse scleroderma. If it just stays on the forearms, hands, lower legs and feet, that's limited scleroderma, what used to be called the Crest syndrome. When we talk to the doctor about this, this is the way that they can assess whether or not their patient is the same, better or worse, between therapies. And of course, skin is an important uh, element to the patient because it's symptomatic, it interferes with hand motion, uh, quality of life and function. So this gets maybe drilling down a little bit deeper. When you look at uh, a clinical feature like skin, what you really want to know is whether or not it's in fact a valid way to assess the disease. And the scleroderma clinical research community has been working uh, hard in this area over the last 15 years about trying to define just how reliable are our different measures. So when we're considering something like skin, uh, we want to know, does it have face validity? Does it make sense? Content validity? Is it comprehensive? Construct validity? Does it agree with other measures or with the gold standard? Is it accurate? Is it reproducible? Is it sensitive to change? And is it feasible? So for an outcome measure to really pass the so-called OMARAC filter, it really has to meet all of these criteria. So just to consider skin, it's very accurate when we train doctors, the inter-observer variability, the difference between two observers is only five units. That's extremely good. The reproducibility, how consistent any given research physician is, is even better, only three units. It's clearly accessible because it's just a simple clinical examination technique, and it's sensitive to change. We've already talked about how particularly in diffuse scleroderma, it worsens early and improves later. Here's part of the problem, though, with our studies that have focused on uh, the modified Rodden skin score. This is one of the bigger trials we did that was depressingly negative. Uh, this was with recombinant human relaxin, which is a pregnancy-related hormone that had some laboratory effects that argued that it had anti-scarring properties. Here is uh, the change in modified Rodden skin score over a six-month long study. So this draws out the zero line. You can see that the placebo group had patients that worsened, but so did the low-dose and the high-dose relaxing groups. But what I really want to point out is here's over six months. Look at the placebo patients. Uh, actually, the dominant course on six months of placebo, sugar pill, no active medication, was to improve their skin score. And some of these patients had amazing improvements in skin score, 10, 15, 20 units. And that's by doing nothing. So this may look like a hopelessly busy slide, but this is some of the most critically important data we've seen in years in our trials of scleroderma. These are 635 patients who were in our recent large trials who were treated either with sugar pill or were treated with drugs that were found to be not any better than sugar pill. A good example there would be D-penicillamine, uh, clearly no better than placebo. Uh, another example would be the recombinant human relaxant studies I just showed you. Now the blue line in the center is what the average skin score was over 24 months of follow-up. You can see that these patients that came into these trials had pretty high skin scores, a 27. And then well, while on sugar pill or on drugs that were proven to be not effective, the tendency was for skin to improve. Now, if you look at the individual green lines, those are the actual plots of how the skin behaved in individual patients, the so-called spaghetti plot. 
So you can see that there were patients in this group that had wonderful levels of improvement over short periods of time, but then disheartenedly, dishearteningly, there were patients in this group that continued to worsen in their skin score. So this gets back to that element of heterogeneity that I was talking about. But I think there are lessons for the individual patient. Uh, if you start a therapy of some sort, uh, let's say peanut butter, and you see your skin improve, uh, it's human nature to attribute that improvement to what you were doing for your disease. I think it's always wonderful to hear that somebody is improving. And we get many, many stories of people that are enjoying improvement. And that's just wonderful news. But that doesn't necessarily mean that what you had done in seeking a therapy for scleroderma is what did the trick. It may have been your good fortune or maybe even something about your genetics that influence the way the disease behaved once you've got it. So nobody wants to argue with success, but we do need to be careful about how we interpret success. This is a different take on this same phenomenon about skin involvement. These are data from the wonderful scleroderma program at uh, Royal Free Hospital in London, led by Carol Black and then now by Chris Denton. And there are several hundreds of patients here with diffuse scleroderma. And what we're graphing here is how many months of disease did those patients have until they hit their maximum skin involvement, the turnaround point. You can see there was a group that's disease stopped within six months, another group stopped within 12 months, another group where the disease seemed to have stopped by 12 to 18 months. In fact, about 50% of the patients had their skin involvement arrest in the first 18 months of disease. And then there was another 50% where there was a longer, more aggressive course, including patients that, uh, although thankfully uncommon, who as late as six years into their disease were still experiencing skin thick, worsening of their skin thickening. So imagine that we were doing a research trial where we wanted to prevent skin thickening. This would suggest that we would need to look at patients who were very early in the disease because that's where the dominant number of patients would be experiencing that clinical event. If we wanted to measure change as an effect of the drug, we should measure that in patients that were at high risk for change. If we wanted to do something to prevent or reverse disease, then it would be applicable to those early patients, but also patients that were later in their disease. But it would, then what we would be doing is recruiting patients that had some level of severity where we could then try to reverse the severity. And we can do trials like this. This is a Unfortunately, a negative trial that was trying to trap and lower a key uh, scleroderma-related chemical called transforming growth factor beta-1. But here we showed that the community was able to uh, recruit a group of patients. They were on average only about six months into their disease, including one patient that was only 0.3 months, three weeks into their scleroderma, so that we could jump on the disease very early on and do something to modify the course of the skin. And there are several ways of looking at the data, but here over a 24-week period, you could see that we could actually lead to improvement or it would be associated with stability. So it's a question of an issue of feasibility. So I guess the question is, why does skin get better on its own? Well, because it can. The skin has an inherent uh, capacity to remodel, but we don't know if whatever the driving stimulus was seems to slow down. There's some interesting data that argues that it's actually a host factor that gets back to the genetics of the, of the person with the disease. Some of this is actual reversal of the disease, but some of it may be a level of damage called atrophy. But then we have this key question about what we learn from the skin. Is that actually a window on other tissues? For example, if we had a good effect on the skin, would that automatically lead to a good effect on the lung? And then I told you I was going to talk about organ-specific therapies, and I'll, I'll give you an example of why that's so important. This is a very busy graph that shows how even though survival from scleroderma is dramatically better than it was 10, 20 years ago, what we're seeing is that the patterns of survival are changing. 
So way back in the early 70s, scleroderma renal crisis, where I have the dot right now, was the biggest cause of death. But like we mentioned before, the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors have really sort of squashed that out of being a major problem. And what we've seen as as more patients uh, go on and on in their disease, uh, in recent decades, it's been mainly lung that is the leading cause of late disease morbidity, disability, and even death. And it's approximately equally developed, uh, equally distributed between patients that have scarring of the lung and patients that have blood vessel damage of the lung, so-called pulmonary hypertension. So if we wanted to make the next big leap forward in terms of extending survival of improving quality of life in scleroderma, it would be effective development of treatments for the lung. So as Luke mentioned earlier, some of that's done with the private sector where there are now nine approved drugs uh, that include scleroderma in their labeling for treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension. And there are another five that we anticipate approval on in the next two years. But what about interstitial lung disease when the lungs become inflamed and scarred? Well, the NIH supported a study with the immune suppressant drug cyclophosphamide that showed that that was effective as well. Here, what we're seeing is at the end of a year, the loss of forced vital capacity, a measure of how stiff the lungs are, was uh, greater than three in patients receiving placebo. And it was only about half of that in patients that were receiving cyclophosphamide. We also saw that cyclophosphamide led to some improvement in skin thickening. Um, here, though, we're looking at what the change in forced vital capacity was. This is done in the pulmonary function lab and is a very easily reproducible measure of lung stiffness. What we're seeing in the red line is what happened on patients on cyclophosphamide, and what we're seeing in the yellow line is what happened on sugar pill. What one can see is that at the end of one year, there was only about a 1% change. Cyclophosphamide was stopped at that point because it has toxicities. If you have too much exposure to it, the lungs continue to get a little bit better at 18 months. But by the end of 24 months, it had come right back down to around where placebo was. So this is a statistically significant trial, but it's one where you actually have to critically look at it and say, is a change of only 1% or 2% over a year that is not durable, in fact, it's actually gone after another year, is that enough of an effect, or should we be looking for better therapies? So it's always wonderful to do a positive trial, and it, but I think that if you don't do clinical research where you don't learn some lessons from it that inform the development of future trials, then you're really not uh, taking full advantage of the experience. So the question is, what did we learn from scleroderma lung study number one, the cyclophosphamide study? Well, the first question is, what about the level of percent forced vital capacity, this pulmonary function laboratory measure? Did that predict how patients did on drug? And the answer was absolutely yes. You can see that patients that entered the trial with a forced vital capacity under 70% did really, really well on drug, whereas those on placebo uh, lost about 7% of their lung function. Whereas if you take patients with very mild changes in their forced vital capacity, there was no difference between drug and placebo. We had recruited this study since cyclophosphamide is a very strong anti-immune system, anti-inflammatory drug to try to identify patients whose lungs seemed to be actively inflamed before they started the trial. So one of the tests for that is called bronchoalveolar lavage, where the lungs are washed and the number of inflammation cells are counted. And in fact, it turned out that the level of inflammation by this test didn't have anything to do with how patients did. Here we're looking at the patients had positive and negative studies. It didn't predict clinical course. It did not predict response to drug. What about the level of scar that could be seen on the fancy x-ray technique called high-resolution CAT scan that's become the standard? Okay, here we see with the little blue arrows several areas that everyone would agree represent areas of scarring in scleroderma lung. When we look at the severity of scarring, no scarring, level one, two, three, four, you can see that the worse the scarring was when patients came into the study, 
the more likely to benefit from cyclophosphamide and the more likely to deteriorate on placebo. Whereas if you look at the patients had relatively little scar, there was no difference between drug and sugar pill over a 12-month study. Then finally, there's an x-ray technique using the same high-resolution CAT scan called looking for ground glass, which was at the time thought to represent areas of the lung that were actively inflamed. So here we see in this circle an area that people would agree was very typical ground glass. And much to our surprise as investigators, uh, the level of ground glass involvement of the lung offered no predictive information about whether or not cyclophosphamide was going to be effective or would be an appropriate therapy. So if you look at all of this, we're saying in a very simple way that we had designed a study seeking patients who had mainly inflammation because we were going to use an anti-inflammation treatment. It turned out that our test of inflammation offered no valuable direction about whether or not to use the drug or not. Instead, what we found was that patients responded to the drug based on a level of disease severity, how much scar on their CAT scan, uh, how much change in their pulmonary function test. So again, we're back to these 635 patients that we talked about before that were uh, participants in trials where they received either sugar pill or they received drugs that were no better than sugar pill. And here we're looking at the same measure again, the forced spinal capacity, a measure of stiffness of the lung. What one can see in this 635 early diffuse scleroderma patients receiving either no treatment or ineffective treatment that actually the average course was for the pulmonary function test to remain completely stable. But again, look at the green lines, the spaghetti plots uh, about individual patients. There were a lot of patients who had very stable pulmonary function tests. That's great. But what we're really worried about are these patients that are having rapid declines. How do we identify those patients? Because those are the patients in the most need of therapy but those are also the patients that would be the most appropriate to be in a research trial. So just like skin improves, the same question becomes, why does lung stabilize? And one of the reasons that it can't improve, there are no human diseases where we know that the air sacs of the lung can grow back. But is, it something, is there something about scleroderma that we don't quite yet understand? Does the driving <laughs> stimulus of the disease go away on its own? Is this another issue of host factors, or there's something about your individual biology that uh, puts you at a higher risk of worsening versus uh, being more likely to be stable? Um, so these are important questions because the individual patient needs to be thinking about that with their individual bedside clinician. Now, while we were doing all this work, uh, Athol Wells, who's been a wonderful investigator of scleroderma lung disease in England, was also trying to come up with clues about what predicts who's at risk for lung disease that's going to worsen. And what this is is a multiple re regression analysis where you list almost every feature that is reasonable, and then you run a statistical test to see which features are actually predictive. So in terms of what influences who's at risk for losing lung volume, worsening disease, it gets down to the extent of disease on the high-resolution CAT scan and the extent of reticulation. That's what SCAR is called when you see it on a CAT scan. It was exactly what we found from the American study of cyclophosphamide. Now, while all of this was going on, we were doing a trial that we had by accident insisted that there be enough severity on high-resolution CAT scan uh, to warrant uh, being in the trial. This was a trial of Bosentam, which is a very effective drug for pulmonary hypertension, but unfortunately didn't seem to work for interstitial lung disease. But what we're seeing is that patients that met these same criteria from the American study of cyclophosphamide and Athol Wells, 25% uh, of those patients were at significant loss of function during a one-year-long study. So this just buttresses the concept that we can now actually identify a group of patients that are at risk for worsening 
So these are the patients that need treatment, but these are also the types of patients that would be most appropriate to put into a research trial because it actually gives you the opportunity of measuring whether or not a drug is truly effective. So we have standards from the FDA about how to get a drug approved for interstitial lung disease. They want to show a survival benefit. They want to show that there's a dose response. We want to see patient reported outcomes about shortness of breath, quality of life. These all seem reasonable, but these are actually very, very high hurdles to overcome. And it's one of the reasons that even though there's a lot of activity in interstitial lung disease, including scleroderma, uh, no drug yet has been approved although there are several promising candidates. The research community has published uh, what we think the scleroderma trial standards should be, and this uh, reference that's in this slide is freely accessible to anybody in the public, uh, and I urge you to go look at this about how we want to proceed with lung trials. Okay, and then finally, I would like to talk about composite response index because we need to have some other utilitarian way of going after disease. Uh, what the combined response index in systemic sclerosis, the technical term for scleroderma, is, is, is a consensus of uh, 95 international experts in scleroderma about what actually should be measured in a global composite index that reflects the overall disease. And I'm pleased to say that the NIH uh, has sponsored a field trial uh, where we're actually validating how well this outcome measure performs. And even though that trial is not yet done, this is now sort of the standard in our overall trials of scleroderma. We look at skin, musculoskeletal features, heart, lung, heart and lung together, gastrointestinal, kidney, Raynaud phenomenon, and digital ulcers. Um, health-related quality of life and function, global health, biomarkers, and then other uh, measures. And the reason we want a composite index is that it's inherently more sensitive to change. But it also introduces sort of a standard template about how to investigate scleroderma. We could look at a drug that was effective for Raynaud's and digital ulcers and other blood vessel features using the same way that we would look at a drug that was mainly uh, directed against inflammation or mainly directed against scar. <clears throat> and we would be able to actually compare the overall benefit uh, and then be able to compare the relative benefit of drug A versus drug B. Uh, composite response indices, indices are inherently very sensitive to change, which should make it easier to actually use them in a trial. So just to give you a couple of quick examples, here are the elements that go into skin. It's the modified broadened skin score. Uh, importantly, looking for patient opinion, an overall physician rating, then a durometer. That's a test of measuring skin hardness in a non-invasive fashion. Uh, here's health-related quality of life using very uh, highly validated outcome measures that have performed well in past trials, not just in scleroderma, but in other diseases as well. So each one of these features of disease has its own specific measures. Then finally, I'm almost done here, but uh, science informs the clinician, just like the clinician can inform the scientist in the lab about what the basic questions are. This is an example of work uh, supported uh, through the Scleroderma Research Foundation that has the whole research community very, very excited, and the continuation of this work uh, is, is really in full swing right now through a big grant from the NIH. So it's a wonderful example of uh, seeding a promising creative research project uh, through the funds of the Scleroderma Research Foundation, then see it effectively leveraged in a much bigger grant to flesh it out. I, I can't imagine a better scenario. What this graph basically shows is that patients with worse skin involvement or active skin involvement express a very standard panel of genes that help us to understand that the biology of what's going on in the skin is very active. These genes happen to point us towards transforming growth factor beta and interferon as being key regulators of the biology of disease. But now, all of a sudden, we're on the cusp 
of having a simple laboratory test done off of a skin biopsy that would let us know on a scientific basis who was active, who was destined to be worse, versus who was already spontaneously quieting their disease down. You can begin to see how this would lead to sort of tailored measure, medicine where the doctor could adjust the therapy to your individual personal circumstance, but it should be easy to see how you could select patients who were active for clinical trials, where you could then, again, since you had an active population destined to have change, it would be easier to assess whether or not the drug was better than doing nothing, better than a placebo. Here's a similar argument for trying to figure out the lung. I mean, we think we've made wonderful advances with the lung because with pulmonary function test and CAT scanning, x-ray technique, we're pretty confident about figuring out who's uh, at risk for worsening. But there are also biomarkers that, produce, uh, that inform us in that same way. This is just one example. There are several. CCL18 is a chemical released by the activated macrophage population. And what one can see is that when you treat the lung effectively, its levels fall. They're generally very elevated, and patients have active lung disease. So this is a wonderfully robust tool for future trials. So this is my last slide. What I've tried to do is give you sort of a primer about where we are in the science of doing clinical trials. We think that we've gotten very smart about how to identify patients that are at risk for worsening skin and risk for worsening lung, and we're focusing our research on this particularly active population. Because we're having to sort of cut scleroderma into smaller slices to be able to do trials effectively, these trials do become more difficult to recruit, but they are inherently much more reliable in their design. Our choices of interventions or candidate treatments are increasingly driven by hard science. We're no longer just taking educated guesses, where we're taking something we've learned from the lab and then trying to directly apply that to the disease. And the sophistication about how to measure disease is far better than it ever was. I guess this is a two-edged sword. Uh, the first lesson here is that there's an amazing amount of progress, and Luke referred earlier to the 30 major projects that are in progress right now, and I'm aware of another 20 that are planning stages. Um, uh, so it's great to know that there's work going on. It's great to know there's better science. It's great to know that the trials are more reliably designed. But the downside here is that you may want to participate, we may need you to participate, but you may not actually have the type of disease that's appropriate for the trials. So one of the lessons here is that if we are, we're all in this together, there may be patients who have early progressing skin or who have more severe lung that are going to do all the heavy lifting for all of us. But if we learn from that population that we've got an effective therapy, one can easily see the benefits extending as truly generalizable for all. I thank you for your attention. I think we'll open it up for questions now. Kim, that was terrific. Um, we do have about uh, 10 minutes or so to, uh, um, to further explore some of these issues. So um, uh, why don't we go ahead and take some questions from the group. And, and while those are queuing up, I'm just going to go ahead and ask a couple uh, to maybe sort of stimulate some additional thinking. Um, you showed a graph at one point about uh, the different courses of diffuse and limited disease, um, and then you showed sort of a later sort of histogram about you know, basically where mortality is, um, <clears throat> is being evidenced today in terms of basically lung disease. Do you want to just try and help um, our listeners sort of understand a bit more about sort of the correlation between some of that skin data and then lung data and sort of the different diffuse and limited populations and, um, you know, where yeah, and, and how to link those two sort of findings, if you will. Because on one hand, we got skin in the different sort of subcategories. You know, like we're talking about mortality and lung. So could we just link that up for patients a little bit more tightly? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And uh, to be, achieve more clarity in that, I think would be very, very important. Uh, interstitial lung disease refers to that mixture of inflammation and scar of the actual lung tissue. And that has a strong relationship with people that are having inflammation and scarring in the skin. So people with diffuse scleroderma 
have a higher risk of having the same sort of process that's going on in the skin also be going on in the lung. That, however, is, remember, this disease is very heterogeneous. There are individuals with very limited skin involvement that pick up interstitial lung disease very early on. On the other hand is pulmonary vascular disease, that damage to the blood vessels in the lung can lead to high blood pressure in the lung. Uh, the majority of patients that develop that are in later years of having limited scleroderma. So remember, these are individuals that have had maybe 10 or 15 years of Raynaud phenomenon and blood vessel damage in their fingers. And then for some reason it extends into the blood vessel of the lungs as well. But even though limited scleroderma might be of higher risk of pulmonary hypertension, maybe in the order of 12% or so, many individuals with diffuse scleroderma get that as well, and even at earlier stages. So I, I guess you asked the question seeking clarity, and I, actually my answer probably showed how there's a general lack of clarity here, is that uh, there are different levels of inflammation, scar, and blood vessel damage in each individual patient. Uh, people with bad skin have a higher risk of interstitial lung disease. People with long-standing vascular problems have a higher risk of lung vascular problems. But there's enough overlap in the middle that you have to be thinking about those problems in everybody. Great. Let me. I'm going to go ahead and take some questions from, from the floor, if you will. Um, there's a, um, a couple questions about, I think, maybe SLS2 and just sort of, you know, what, what do we know about uh, the role of cell step mycophenolate, uh, you know, and, you know, what are we trying to learn in some of the, you know, industry, I guess it's now NIH-sponsored, you know, clinical work? Well, I think the, it's a great trial to bring up because, number one, again, it's the NIH sponsoring, and it really is your tax dollar at work. And if you ever felt unloved as a scleroderma patient by the National Institute of Health, you should not be because they really are weighing in a major fashion. It was the Heart and Lung Institute that sponsored scleroderma one trial. It's the Heart and Lung Institute that's sponsoring the, scler the SLS2. Uh, it was the... Um, Immunology and Allergy Institute at NIH that actually put $20 million forward to do the American Controlled Trial of Stem Cell Transplant, where we have finished recruiting there, and now we're sitting back waiting for a couple of years to see how much benefit we achieve. So uh, the federal government has really weighed in. This is a, a, a tough subject to just do in a sound bite. It was great to see that cyclophosphamide was effective. But please remember that cyclophosphamide has toxicities if you're exposed to it too long. So when people come off of cyclophosphamide, it doesn't look like the effect on the lung is particularly durable. Mycophenolate Moffatel, uh, brand name Celsep, there are pilot data that argue that this uh, more benign immune suppressant that can be continued for long periods of time might be effective for scleroderma lung disease as well. So what we're in the process of doing right now is SLS2, where half of patients are getting cyclophosphamide for a year, followed by a year of follow-up, and the other half of patients are getting mycophenolate mofetil for a full two years. We're all really uh, on tenterhooks waiting for that study, because there's a lot of promising information about mycophenolate mofetil, but this will be a robust, large uh, trial informed by SLS1 that will give us better information about mycophenolate mofetil. Um, Tim, let's talk a little bit about CRIS again, because I do think that, you know, when we see some of the more recent successes in lupus for the very first time, it really came about, you know, as much as anything from having designed a really robust scoring system and a brand, almost a brand new one that the FDA finally was willing to basically get on board with. Can we just talk for a little, um, for, for a couple minutes, just about Chris? And are they using Chris in SLS two, or is that is that the study that's going to validate that as an endpoint? And where do you see the evolution away from, say, uh, almost exclusive f focus on the Rodnan over to sort of a more robust sort of you know whole body metric, if you will? Actually, almost every trial that's being done right now is incorporating el every element of the Chris. So we're on the cusp of having loads and loads of data about just how well it works in trials. Uh, the NIH is actually, through the Arthritis Institute, sponsoring just an observational study. Uh, 
at UCLA, the University of Michigan, Boston University, and the University of Texas at Houston, uh, just gathering CRIS data on more than 200 early diffuse scleroderma patients and just measuring in a truly expert way just exactly how it performs. So uh, to try to simplify what I'm just saying is that uh, to really have a truly effective therapy for scleroderma, you want to look at every element of how scleroderma can affect the population. In some individuals, that's maybe mainly joint pain or brain nodes or finger ulcers. In other individuals, it might mainly be gastrointestinal tract problems. Other individuals might be focused on skin or might be focused on shortness of breath. But if you had a single tool that was able to measure that core problem but also measure everything else about the disease, that would really be instructive. Uh, don't you want a therapy to not just change a lab test or not just change, so for example, if you've got a little skin thickening on the chest and it goes away, is that important to you if you're still having trouble swallowing and can't move your hands? Uh, what you want is something that actually measures the overall impact and increasingly we are aware about how patient opinion, patient reported outcomes, what you think of the advantages that you've gotten for a therapy, that ends up being critical about whether or not a therapy is truly effective or not. So it's just great to have the tool. And Luke, I think your example of the lupus community is great. The lupus community struggled for 15 years to finally come up with scales that uh, could measure lupus in all of its heterogeneity. Because remember, there's some lupus patients that have mainly skin and joints, and then there are other lupus patients whose biggest problem might be some kind of kidney inflammation. How do you put apples and oranges, the phrase of the week, all into one bucket, and then be able to measure whether or not you're actually changing the disease? So the composite index offers great, great promise. Tim, thanks. Um, I think we've kind of reached the end of our hour. Um, I would really like to thank everyone for joining us today and participating in our first webinar. When you close the window, you can provide some valuable feedback to us, and, um, and we really very much appreciate your thoughts and opinion. And I'd, I'd like to you know, deeply uh, uh, reference uh, Dr. Tim Seibel, scleroderm research consultants, for his commitment to scleroderm patients over 30 years, as well as his time today. Our next webinar will take place on Thursday, December 15th, again at 9 a.m. Pacific time. But that, uh, in that webinar, we will feature Dr. John Varga of Northwestern University, who is a foremost expert in scleroderma fibrosis. More information will be available on the Foundation's website. And just as a reminder, today's entire webinar will be available for download beginning next week on the SRF website. For more information, and of course to support the Scleroderma Research Foundation, or just to read more about current research and news in the community, please visit the Scleroderma Research Foundation's website at www.sclerodermaresearch.org or www.srfcure.org. Again, thank you very much for joining us today. Goodbye. Thank you. Please stand by.